Welcome from my side. My name is Philip. I'm with the World Economic Forum and I have now the honor and pleasure to moderate our today's session about the future of Europe. And allow me first to introduce our two high-level guests and panelists. Certainly you all know her. Mogherini, she's a high representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security. Madame Mogherini, a warm welcome. Thank you. We have also here on the side Maurice Lévy. Maurice Lévy is the CEO of the Publicis Group and French, so he has a good knowledge of France as well as the economic and political development, certainly in respect of the recent elections. So, High Representative, allow me to ask you the first question. So, we had in Davos a remarkable, if not a historic speech by the Chinese president. And many commentators say, look, this is a proof that we are truly living in a multipolar world. And my question is now to you as a high representative of the European Commission, does that mean that Europe and European Union is willing to take over more responsibility in the global discussions? And can we understand even maybe your participation here at our Middle East North Africa summit that does that mean some engagement and stronger engagement here in the region? Well, that goes without uh, even the question, uh, because uh, the European Union is already, uh, not only here in the region, but uh, in all different corners of the world, from East Asia to Latin America, the first uh, trading partner, the first source of economic investments, the first humanitarian donor, the first provider of uh, development uh, assistance, uh, and I could continue like this. In some areas of the world, also uh, a security provider. And we have just a couple of days uh, ago in Brussels decided important steps on strengthening the European defense. Uh, so uh, it is quite clear for us uh, what the role of the European Union is in the world. Let me tell you that uh, in our partners, from China to India to Brazil to Canada to the United States, we see that our partners now uh, look at the European Union uh, looking for predictability and uh, somehow seeing in us a reliable partner, an indispensable partner. The United Nations Secretary General was delivering this message just a couple of days ago in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Uh, the question maybe is, are the Europeans aware of the responsibility we have uh, on the global scene? The European leadership, for sure, has this sense of responsibility. Uh, I guess that after the uh, Dutch elections, the French elections, this responsibility will be uh, even more central to our work. Uh, but I have to say that uh, less than one year ago, the end of June, everybody was saying that the UK referendum was going to be the beginning of the end. And today, we're definitely in a different place. We see a reaction from the 27 unity, determination to go on, uh, take on our shoulders responsibilities that others might maybe start to put aside, and uh, relaunch the project of the European integration at 27. And that was done in Rome, celebrating the 60th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Treaties of Rome. And I believe the French uh, people clearly indicated the need to reinvest and relaunch in the European Union integration process. So not only 60 years of peace and rights, and economic prosperity, because seen from the other words, the other parts of the world, Europe is definitely an island of peace and stability, even if we have a lot of problems. But also inside, I think that now we start to see the need to reinvest in our union and also to change it. Thank you, Federica Moraghini. I think that was the right buzzword to talk about the French people, for example, that takes ways directly to Maurice Lévy. So you're very close, allow me to, to mention this to the new president in France. So can you explain to the, to the people what can we expect for France, but particularly for Europe and its integration? Okay, I'm not the spokesperson of uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, and uh, I'm not in charge of making his communication. So therefore, I will say the thing from my point of view and not uh, engaging his responsibility. The first thing that I would like to say is that uh, Europe is today the land of hope. 
and that uh, we, in most of the European countries, we have defeated the populism. And that is probably the best news. And unfortunately, populism has been winning in the Anglo-Saxon countries, UK and US. So this is probably the best news that we could have expected to see. And uh, Europe will certainly tomorrow be the land of prosperity because uh, when you see what happened in Spain, when Rajoy has won against the populists, <coughs> when you see that in Italy, Renzi is coming back. Yeah, you see in the Netherlands that um, the populist has been uh, defeated in Austria and finally in France. And in France, Emmanuel Macron has made a campaign since the very beginning championing Europe. It's not something that came a little bit aside. It has been at the core of his campaign. And he explained to the people that Europe is something which is very good for the people. He has not hidden uh, the difficulties uh, behind Europe. He has uh, defended Europe, promoted Europe. And clearly, uh, my view is that he will work very closely with uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel and rebuilt what has been built in, uh, uh, with uh, Giscard d'Estaing Schmidt, uh, with Mitterrand Kohl, with uh, uh, later on uh, Chirac and Schroeder. Uh, so I believe that this team will really, they will work hand in hand and they will promote uh, Europe, which has been uh, uh, damaged by a, a, a few. Uh, uh, issues, reputation, etc. And the one who will be the loser is clearly the UK. So that's my, my views. And I think also that what we will be doing is addressing the key issues, uh, obviously economical issues, which we need to address uh, with uh, very serious and deep reforms. And I am pretty sure that this is something that is taking uh, uh, very seriously. And I believe also that he will play a more, a, a bigger international role. Uh, first trip was to uh, see Angela Merkel. Second trip is to go to Mali. I think uh, you don't need to be uh, a, a, a great specialist of uh, uh, foreign affairs to understand the, the position of Emmanuel Macron. It's clear that uh, he will play a global role on the global scene. Thank you very much. And without any question, I think it was a great political geisha to have these outlined trips. My question is, so there have been in the past some discussions between France and Germany in terms of the economic policies. And um, what can we expect, and you are a businessman and business leader, from the economic policy from President Macron, given that it's still on the discussion between France and Germany, and you're right, so I think it was always good for Europe when France and Germany have been very close together. So this will be the future as well, even there are some different opinions in terms of the economic development. There will be always different opinions. So we, you cannot expect to have uh, two different countries to be fully aligned on everything. So, and it's good. It's good because the, they are different. Uh, but uh, they are aligned on the most important aspect. The first thing is that Macron, during his campaign, has said that he is not going to raise the dividend. The <laughs> oh my God! Uh, You're the CEO. Yeah, I'm a CEO. Businessman. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned before, I, I'm a CEO. Uh, uh, Two. It is not go going to raise the deficit, and he will stick to the current budget. That is the. Uh, something that he has stated several times during the campaign, and uh, everything that he has planned to do goes in that direction. The second is that he has made very clear that the one of the first topics that he has in his agenda is the labor reform, the labor code reform, which is uh, very complex in France, and uh, it's something for which he, he will act immediately and which is, by the way, something we all know 
is a, a, a difficult hurdle uh, for a lot of employers because they believe that uh, if they hire, it will be extremely difficult to fire if they are in uh, uh, facing difficult times. And he wants to solve that problem, and it's the, the, the very first aspect. The third is the tax agenda, where he would like to reduce the tax for the individuals and uh, also for the corporation, and making sure that this can generate uh, a more uh, revenue for the people and therefore nurture uh, the growth of uh, the country. So when you look at his uh, uh, reform agenda, it's not a revolution. So it's, and it's not as harsh as what uh, uh, François Fillon was uh, planning to do, but it is something which should certainly put back France in the right tracks. Mm. So I believe that he is very serious. He has uh, a very good government who is a consensual, uh, and I believe he will take uh, head on all the issues immediately in order to solve the, pro the to make the decision, not to solve the problem, to make the decision during the summer in order that as soon as we are back to school, we are back to normal in terms of uh, the key reforms. Thank you. And both of you have already mentioned the Brexit and the decision by the people in the UK to leave the European Union. Radeka Mogherini, may I ask you, so what will be the positioning, despite the noise we have now due to the elections in the UK, in Germany, and recently in France, what will be the positioning by the European Commission in terms of the negotiations? And uh, I think the business community is interested in <coughs> if there's an idea to keep the UK as close as possible to the EU and the single market? Well, first of all, I fully share what Maurice was saying. Um, I think that uh, down the road we will all see that uh, the big losers of the game that currently is being played uh, will be the UK. And probably this was not part of uh, the considerations uh, back one year ago. And many things were not part of the considerations one year ago, if you look at uh, the political positioning inside the UK um, politics. Uh, the position on the European Union side, on the 27th side, uh, is very clear. We've given a mandate uh, with a three minutes decision in the European Council uh, to the negotiator, uh, Michel Barnier, uh, to solve first uh, the issues that are vital for the citizens of the 27 that will stay, the rights of the citizens, uh, how the UK will honour its commitments uh, budget-wise, and the issue of Ireland, uh, that is a key issue for, uh, I believe, all of us, and uh, not only our, our continent, but also globally. Uh, and then, only after these issues will be uh, tackled and solved, we will move to negotiating um, the future relationship with the UK, including what comes to my file, which is our future, well, actually, at that moment, the old file will come to my desk because it will mm. start to become a third part, a third country. So it will become part of the external relations of the European Union. Uh, so at that time, will become my responsibility uh, once it will be out. Uh, but at that stage, we will start uh, tackling with the future partnership we will have on security, on foreign policy, on defense. The UK is currently already signaling their willingness to stay engaged on our foreign policy, on our security policy, um, which is something good, but these negotiations will start only after the first phase will be concluded. I would like to come back, if I can, on one thing that Maurice mentioned, the, um, the quality and the, the messages that uh, Emmanuel is sending on the, um, on the cabinet, on the government. Um, if you look at my files, I have Jean-Yves Le Drian, uh, a clear, committed European, being a minister for Europe and foreign affairs in this order, with a clear, and he called me, well, we, we know each other since years, but he called me in a few hours after his uh, appointment as a clear sign of France willing to play the major role that France always plays as a permanent member of the Security Council, as a major power in the world, but through the European angle, investing in the strong European Union global role, and 
Minister of Defence, Sylvie Goulard, that is very well known for being a strong European. And I also talked to her in the first hours after um, she took office. And uh, I'm sure that uh, with this team in place, at least on my side of, uh, of the competences, we will have a major, major push to the uh, global role of the European Union, both on the traditional foreign policy files, diplomacy, but also uh, what I was saying before, all the leverages we have from the economic to the uh, development ones on the climate uh, change agreement, for instance, all the different aspects that sometimes we underestimate we have instruments to uh, work globally, but also a big push to uh, the defense European agenda. That is the one that we're currently uh, building in a very consistent manner. So I'm sure that France will contribute enormously uh, to relaunch the European Union integration process, uh, for sure on the foreign uh, and security policy side, but also, I agree with you, uh, also on the economic files, uh, because uh, I, I'm convinced that this will be uh, also one of the key elements of, uh, of the future of the Union. And by the way, one thing uh, I was thinking of, because I think our, the title of our um, thing is the future of the Union. Mm -hmm. One thing I, we always give for granted is that uh, uh, the future of the European Union will be at 27. Actually, we're negotiating accession with several countries. so. When we talk about the future of the European Union, this is not a very popular issue in France, but we have to take into consideration the fact that countries, especially in the Western Balkans, will eventually become members of the European Union. So we will be more than 27 uh, if things go in the right direction. So the power of attraction of the European Union is still extremely strong. And if you look at the uh, level of trust and confidence of the public opinions in the Western Balkans, for instance, uh, it's uh, in many countries around 70, 75 percent. Mm. So we still have a power, uh, even if sometimes we don't recognize it. And it's a waste, because if we don't recognize it, then we tend not to use it. But I think, I share the optimism, I think the European Union will be the land of hope in the coming, in coming years. That sounds very promising. Even uh, I would no, love no, to you ask... you open the floor and we come back to reality. If, 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 no, if <laughs> you mentioned that... Is, Today it's or soon 27 and maybe once 28, 29. I think Turkey is not the top candidate yet for the 28th uh, soon. But That's but another debate. Yeah, no, but <laughs> exactly. But I, I really like what you mentioned at the beginning. So to say, look, thinking one year before June 2016, no one would put any bet on the European Union. To be honest, after the decision in the UK, and now the election in the Netherlands, but particularly, to be honest, in France, is a really a game changer. So would you agree, and then we can open it to, to make the reality check, if we are now at the eve, let me say this words, of a European decade? Yes. Uh, it's like, uh, how do you say it in English? Um, in Italian, it's Araba Fenice, that you reburn from your ashes. Uh, European uh, Union... in French. <laughs> ah. <laughs> like like Phoenix. Uh, so, uh, Phoenix. Ah. We, yeah. the Arab Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, you know, the European Union has always moved forward uh, when it faced the most serious crisis. And Europe, in its history, has been like this. Sometimes, and it's a very Mediterranean approach, <laughs> sometimes we really have to be pushed hard and face the, uh, the edge to realize <laughs> what there is to lose and fix it. And I think this is what we have lived this year. We have faced the risk of losing something that our fathers and mothers, and in some cases grandfathers and grandmothers, have built, bringing 60 years of rights, peace, and economic development, when if you look at history, especially from this region, the Europeans have for centuries exported war. And we've been the ones fighting for religion for thousands of years. And at a certain moment, 60 years ago, Wise people and courageous people uh, simply had the intuition that making business together was more convenient. Uh, by the way, I think it's a good idea also for this region, but that's another debate as well. So I think that this last year, uh, Europeans realized, and the French people realized for sure, that we had a lot that we were risking to lose. And there was a sort of reaction to that, saying, OK, we might not like it, but we can save it and change it, rather than throwing it away. And I think this is the message from the French elections. It's not that 
you know, the European Union is perfect, on the contrary. But, you know, you don't like French policies, it may be good to change the government, but you don't say you're anti-French. You don't like European policies, well, they're not coming from the moon. They're coming from political leaders that are elected and that take decisions. So you can change the course of the decisions, the content, saving the box and the instruments you have, because seen from the outside, the European Union is the most amazing regional integration process that history has ever seen. So before throwing away uh, something like this, you'd better fix the policies and readjust the course of some decisions that were made. Personally, I think that in the years of the economic crisis, many things could have been done differently and better from the European Union decision-making side. But again, it's not people coming from Mars taking these decisions. It's elected heads of state and government ministers <coughs> taking decisions. So it's the people that, at the end of the day, have the power to determine the European policies. But again, the sense of responsibility, Europe is what I make of it, that is back, I think, uh, in, in the European scene. So I think that, yes, this year we, we realized, we got scared, and we reacted, and I believe the next 10 years can be, yes, the European decade. Also because I don't see many others in the world that are going to have uh, their own decade starting from now. So uh, we will need to show leadership also worldwide. Maurice, and then I will open for two or three questions. Maurice. Yes, uh, I, I said uh, that uh, Europe is a land of hope, and I believe uh, very sincerely that it's a land of hope. But we should not believe that because Emmanuel Macron has been elected that the problem of Europe are solved. And I'd like to build in a, uh, uh, just a minute on what uh, uh, you have just said. I think that uh, it is very important that we solve our problem, that Europe is less cumbersome, and that uh, the European feel that they are European, and they feel that they are belonging to a Europe that they like, a Europe that is taking care of them. And I, I think that there is something that uh, we should be uh, much more active on, which is communicating with the European people, making them part of the game. And today they are left alone. The only thing they are hearing, uh, with the exception of uh, some uh, uh, moment in the election, is that Europe is complicated, Europe is the mother of all our problems, etc., etc. And this has to be solved. Otherwise, we will have a European which is a European body we, which is detached from the people, and this is the worst thing which can happen. And uh, the only advice I may give as a citizen of Europe is that we better solve our issues and strengthen our position before letting anyone else joining the table. Uh, we have, so we have a clean table, we have good dishes, so when they are joining, they are enjoying the dinner. But before uh, they join, it's much better that we uh, do uh, everything that we need to do, which might, I believe are, are a lot of things, uh, if we want to have a great Europe for the future. So thank you very much. So unfortunately, we have not that much time, but I would like to ask two or three of you for the reality check. What I mentioned, I would like to start with a, uh, Amar Musa, our good friend, and. Uh, Long-standing General Secretary of the uh, Arab League, so it's really interregional. Amo. Thank you, sir. I thank you for the two distinguished uh, members of this panel. I want to raise the issue of the Mediterranean. The policy, the foreign policy of uh, the European Union. You talked about the global dimensions of that policy. I want you to give some thought to the Mediterranean, since. There is the Barcelona Convention, and all the Mediterranean countries, including Europe, have signed that uh, convention. Then it was shelved. I believe, and many like me do believe, that the time has come for the European Union to give special attention to that area, which is, of course, adjacent to the Middle East with all the, the chaos over there. But I believe that if we get back to this Barcelona process, 
with whatever updating that we might need, the political and security basket, the economic and social basket, the cultural basket, we will have a new vistas of opportunity for cooperation and for stabilization of the rest. I just want to, to tell uh, Monsieur Levy that this Mediterranean uh, initiative was established back very early on in the 90s with the initiative from France, that was Juppé, Egypt, that was myself, and Spain and Italy. I so four of us started to launch this, that was 1993, which was crowned in 1995 by the Barcelona process and was adversely affected by what President Sarkozy has done, the European Union, uh, the, the Mediterranean Union, and things went uh, uh, in a wrong direction. We have a chance now. If you wish, just give it a chance, just give it some thought and for the new president to think again of uh, reviving this process. Thank you. So given the time shortage, let's do the following. We will add some colleagues and then we make it in general so that we can. You have been then, then I would like to go to you, then the woman in the second row, and then we have to finish, unfortunately. Maybe you can do some question offline, but unfortunately that's a Swiss institution. Um, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I am Richard Sondergi. I'm in charge of the Société Générale Group in the Middle East. Uh, I am pro-Europe, I'm French. I voted for Macron, uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, like uh, like a lot of us, uh, uh, we feel that uh, Europe or the Union has stopped in the uh, middle of the road, uh, and and that it cannot move forward anymore. And there is a big governance issue. And the more members, and the heavier that governance becomes. Uh, your job, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, uh, you know, is, is the only one I know and the, the first one that has created some kind of a, of a political union, uh, which is very much what's, what's lacking today to represent that force within this multipolar world. Um, now, uh, time is very short, so do you really see that uh, happening uh, soon, uh, because uh, we have seen how difficult it has been, and, and uh, according to you, how uh, can that happen? Is it just a question of the Germans and the French uh, uh, imposing a new governance, or, or, or will it take another few years to have everyone uh, around the table? Okay. If he in the front, and then the woman, and then we are, we are done. Uh, uh, thank you for for this European dream, I go straight to my heart. But, but I guess my question is, what are the really the three actions you would suggest to do in Europe to reverse the back trend? And seen from this region, Europe has lost a lot of position in the last 20 years. China is rising as a, a more important trading partners and political partners. How are we going to reverse that and make Europe again uh, a prime force and a positive force Europe in the Middle East? Europe again, you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, the woman, and then we have to, to unfortunately finish the, the session. But again, we <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Zirke Tempel, editor of International Politik and Berlin Policy Journal in Berlin. Um, Europe has reached already a very deep level of integration. However, in the field of security and foreign policy, we basically reached a core of sovereignty. It's a really deep sovereignty issue in every regard. Could you be, I know, time constraints, but could you be a bit more specific where we could deepen integration in the security and, and um, foreign policy level, taking into consideration that even without the Brits, we won't have a European army very soon? Thank you. Thank you. I'll start, uh, try to be short. Uh, on the Mediterranean, you preach to the converted. Uh, and uh, I believe that really uh, the key here is also in the hands of uh, um, the business not only of uh, the politics, because you know that well, uh, the Mediterranean region is the less integrated region in the world, uh, is the region that has less ex economic exchanges south-south, and it's the most conflictual region of the world. And I believe the three things are connected. So it's an interest we share to increase the level of exchanges, not only north-south, but also south-south. Political, security, economic, trade, everything. Um, on uh, um, uh, the governance problem, uh, look, I, I am uh, the only one in the world 
that sees the different EU institutions from different sides. Uh, some were saying that the Lisbon Treaty was creating a monster and that uh, my job is basically impossible. I think it's perfect because I can mobilize the money on the Commission side and I have the executive uh, when it comes to trade, humanitarian development, but also science and technology or education or um, energy. And you can use all of that in foreign policy. And I have the 28 foreign ministers, defense ministers, development ministers, trade ministers. Uh, and by the way, I have a third hat, which is the head of the European Defense Agency, which I'm using very much in these months. So I see the different sides. I see the intergovernmental and I see the communitarian. And having been a minister myself, I can tell you, the European Union doesn't have a governance problem. The European Union has the problem that Maurice was saying before, a lack of ownership. Because I've been a minister. I know how the trick goes. You go to Brussels, you take decisions in the Council, because decisions are not taken by someone in Brussels, are taken by ministers or prime ministers that gather in Brussels. The only ones that cannot do this trick are the Belgians. Blame on Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> All the rest, I, most of the times, decisions are taken by unanimity. But then you go down <coughs> to the ground floor to meet the press or back home and you say Brussels has decided. This is the problem we're facing, the lack of ownership and responsibility. <coughs> and this is the big revolution. I think this is a revolution Emmanuel is, is going to bring. This sense of ownership, the European Union is me, is us. It's not something else. We have responsibility if it works, if it doesn't work. And by the way, now I'd say something that is not wise to say on the record, but the Brexit uh, process uh, is putting, I think, a lot of clarity on the responsibility side. You cannot do anymore the trick of, I stay in, but I don't like it. You like it, you, you stay in, you make it work. You don't like it, you leave. It's not an encouragement for others to leave, but if you stay in because you recognize the value of being together, you make it work. It's yours. It's yours. So I don't think it's a governance issue. We are too many, we are too mm, fragmented. No, it's a matter of political responsibility. You realize it's your tool to actually be in the globalized multipolar world because none of us is strong and big enough to negotiate with China or with the United States, even France or Germany. We are small countries compared to the rest of the world. So you have a magnificent tool, you can make it work. Obviously, you can also play the blame game to win the election, but Emmanuel showed us that you can also win the election without playing the blame game. On the contrary, using the big instrument you have on the European integration. Um, I know I have to finish. How to reverse this? Um, matching this national and European discourse. Uh, not duplicating or, or distancing the national identity and the European identity. I'm from Rome, I'm Italian, I'm European. Uh, I don't see the contradiction between being from Rome and being Italian. Uh, in some cases on football, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, why should we have a contradiction between French and European identity? And that's why the powerful message of putting the two items together uh, was, was revolutionary. So, the only way to reverse this trend, I think, is this, this realignment of identity. We feel Europeans, we are Europeans, and what we make of the European Union is in our hands. Thank you. Maurice. Uh, in very short, I believe that um, Europe has lost a lot of uh, possibilities in the past, missed opportunities. Uh, you mentioned Mediterranean, you mentioned uh, the, the problem of uh, government, you mentioned the position we lost, uh, and this is very true, and we should not say that uh, the reality is different. We have to be realistic, yes, we lost position. The good news is that uh, we have today a more united Europe. And the fact that we have that more united Europe will help us to have uh, better policies and to put in place uh, better strategies. And I think that uh, uh, from the industrial point of view, from the economic point of view, including from the political point of view, we will be more united. Not only because there is Emmanuel Macron, uh, but also simply because everyone has felt the heat and the risk 
and now they see what they may lose and they understand that they have to work together in order to build the Europe that we all dream about and this is yet to come. So thank you very much and it, certainly I'm not a bit allowed to, to judge anything but allow me to mention it was have been fascinating 30 minutes to see politicians, business leaders, so emotional, pro-European here in the Middle East, North Africa. So really, thank you very much you. to this session. Thank you.